Welcome to the MHP webinar and today's topic is Inventive Step Obviousness Requirements for Dosage Patterns and Analysis of EPO Case Law um, with an eye on UK and the United States and today's interview guests and, um, and uh, speaker is Dr. Ulrich Storz, a partner of our firm. Uh, thank you Uli for being here. Thank you, thank you, Rob, for making the introduction. Um, I maybe to start before you no, no. yourself, I have some uh, technical things to say, some organ organizational things. Um, if you have questions, uh, please just use the chat and uh, put your question into the chat, write your question into the chat, and I will try to uh, follow the chat, and um, then I will ask uh, Uli the question that you had. and. Yeah, so let's jump into the talk, the webinar. Um, Oli, can you introduce yourself? Yes, very, very briefly. Thank you, Rolf, and thank you for making this possible, for <laughs> eating us, the world, into the, the way into the digital world, because, I mean, we have a lot to learn from you. Thank you very much for, 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 for taking that effort. Um, my name is Oli Storz. I'm one of the co-founders of the firm. I'm in the business for 20 years. I'm specializing in biotech patents in, with an emphasis in particular on antibody patents and um, um, prosecution, opposition, strategic counseling. And um, I have been, I've been considering the impact or the meaning of dosage patents for about like 15 years already. And I've, I've written a publication, which I will refer to later, um, which, I also, which I'm also happy to share later on. But I really came across, the more I consider patent law, the more I understand the meaning and the impact of dosage patents. And I wanted to share my insights with you people today. Great. Yeah. So let's uh, jump into your talk. In Great. The step of business requirements for dosage patents. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. Okay. I just... I have about 40 slides. I try to, I try to be as um, as concise and and comprehensive as possible. I know you guys have time restrictions, so I try to keep my my time budget. I have a couple of slides which I will not discuss, which are in the appendix, but we will be able to share the slides upon request. So, to dive deeper into some particular aspects, you can then refer to the slides. Okay. Why dosage patterns? Well, basically, when we speak about pharmaceutical patents, there are three types of second generation patents which can be filed when the active pharmaceutical ingredient patent is already filed. And that is second medical use, that is formulation, and that is dosage regimen patents. And of course, there are plenty of hybrid forms. And to be honest, in reality, most of the second generation patents are hybrid forms which combine two or three of the of the elements, Roman one to Roman three. Um, when we consider formulation patents, um, we must be aware that both the EMA and the FDA typically allow, for example, buffers in the formulation of the originator to be exchanged by equivalent buffers without losing the biosimilar status. And that means that formulation patents, although they are typically filed, can be bypassed, for example, by exchanging the buffer um, without losing the biosimilar status. This Flexibility does not exist in dosage patents. When the label says 40 milligrams, then it is 40 milligrams. And a biosimilar company that wants to bring a biosimilar on the market um, cannot say, okay, we take 39 milligrams because then it would lose the biosimilar status. So on that logic, dosage regimen patents have a, a bigger obstacle for biosimilar companies than um, uh, uh, than formulation patents. And also, while I'm saying biosimilar, of course, I also mean for generic companies. Um, dosage patents belong to the method of treatment category, um, and for that reason, they were for quite some time in some kind of gray area because uh, they were deemed non-patent eligible under Article 53 EPC, which excluded methods of, of, of treatment. Uh, however, um, there was already in the early days the, the European uh, Sonderweg with the, with the Swiss-type claims. Uh, which uh, which made them possible, which made them patent eligible, uh, and the large board of appeal in decision D two out of O eight declared them officially admissible, and also abolished Swiss type claims. Um, but there's an important 
a statement in that decision, and that says that the enlarged Board of Appeal does not ignore the concerns with respect to undue prolongations of patent rights when the only novel feature is the dosage regimen. And in that case, the whole body of jurisprudence relating to the assessment of novelty and inventive step would apply. So what the enlarged Board of Appeal said here, well, examiners do your job. When you see a dosage patent, do your job and examine them properly. Um, which is, I mean, which is which is self-understanding, and it's, I, I find it I find it remarkable that the Enlarged Board of Appeal deemed it necessary to make this statement here. Um, nowadays, patenting issues of dosage patents are typically solved on the side of inventive step and sufficiency and enablement. Um, well, just an example for a typical claim language would be in Europe, use of drug A for the treatment of disease B, where an A is administered as a dose C and or at timing D. So dosage and dosage regimen, the dosage would be just the, the amount of drug, but the dosage regimen would typically be the combination of the, the amount of the drug and the timing of administration. And I, when I speak about dosage patterns or dosage regimen patterns, I use these terms interchangeably. Um, although they do not necessarily mean always the same thing. Um, well, though formally this is a method of treatment claim, it's admissible under Article 54, 4 and 5, under the privilege that purpose-bound compound protection is admissible, even though it is technically a method of treatment. Um, however, although it is considered to be purpose-bound compound protection, the case law of the Board of Appeal requires that the application has to provide some information which renders a therapeutic effect plausible. And that is because even though these claims are considered to be purpose-bound compound protection claims, from the, from the sufficiency side, they are considered to relate to medical treatments. And in order for medical treatment to be, uh, to be plausible, some data have, be, have to be provided to show that that treatment is plausible. Um, that case law relates the, the decisions I mentioned here, T1599 out of 06 and T609 out of 02, they relate to second medical use claims, but the principle also applies to those at regimen claims because they also uh, relate to a medical treatment. Now, what is some information? Well, for example, in second medical use claims, some information could mean like assay data or animal data insofar as they render the therapeutic application in humans plausible for the for the claimed indication. In those regimen claims, you do necessarily you do typically need human in vivo data because uh, assay data or animal data cannot easily be translated to the human situation when we speak about dosages. And that makes the whole thing a little bit tricky. Um, because in dosage patterns you have a data problem. As I said, you need in vivo efficacy data regarding the dosage, and that efficacy data I need to read on humans because it is about human treatment. Um, as said, assay data or in vitro data or animal data are not sufficient. Typically, these th such type of data is obtained in phase two or phase three clinical trials. However, these trials have to be published before the trials start. And this, you, 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 I mean, when you read this, you already realize this, this is the target conflict. You need data for your patent, but the trial that you need to get the data must be published before you can file the patent, and that is a target conflict, of course. So patent applications that claim a dosage regimen can typically only be filed after the first results from the trials are available. And this means that dosage regimen patents oftentimes have to stand the test against the own prior art of the sponsor, namely the clinical trial protocol that is published before the trial starts. Um, Uli, um, just to yeah. interrupt briefly, if anyone has questions uh, during the webinar, please use the chat and ask your questions in the chat, and I will try to interrupt Uli. Um, so yes. please go on. Yes, I, <laughs> I understand that the data density is very high in this presentation. Okay. Um, However, on the other hand side, prior art which discloses or suggests only the dosage without showing results is considered not enabled and hence not novelty relevant. So if you publish a clinical trial plan which discloses the dosage but does not show any results, such trial plan would not be considered, even if it anticipates the dosage regimen, would not be considered novelty relevant because due to the lack of data, it would be considered not enabled. So the clinical trial protocols or clinical trial plans are 
in most cases not novelty relevant, but they can of course be uh, uh, be referred to as closest prior art for our business attacks. Um, now, I have three examples of patentability issues of dosed claims. The first is on added matter. This is a case we were involved in. Um, it was about a dose, an escalating dosed regimen of rituximab for the treatment of CLL. Um, and it said like one, the first dose level was 375 and the subsequent dosages were 500 to 1,500 milligrams per meter square. Um, the specification had the following basis. All patients receive a first dose at 375. Subsequent weekly dosages are given at 500 to 1,500 milligrams per meter, meter uh, to the potency of three. Well, that, that is that was a clerical error. That was not that was not rejected by the by the opposition division. So the correction from meter to the potency of three to meter square was considered admissible. However, um, interestingly, as you see, the claim has no timing. But the basis in the specification had a timing, the weekly dosages. So when the patent proprietor amended the claims to, to put these escalating dosage regimen into the claims, he left away the timing. And why was that the case? Because the label had the same dosage levels, but because rituximab is given in combination with chemotherapy, which is usually given in every four weeks, um, in the approved in, in the EMA label, the administration of rituximab was adopted to the interval of the chemotherapy because simply to increase patient compliance. So, applicant had a problem in the specification. There was the weekly interval, but in the label there was the four-week interval. So, in, in order to make sure that the claims still encompass what is in the label, they simply left away the weekly timing, and that was considered to introduce added matter because a dosage, when you showed results for a dosage regimen with a given timing, these results can only be construed to, to have been achieved with that timing. And simply leaving away the timing creates new subject matter. And for that reason, the patent was finally revoked. Um, the teaching from that is if you disclose dosage regimens in your patent application, you should make sure that there's a certain amount of likelihood that at least one of the disclosed dosage regimens is actually going into the label. In this well, case here... Yeah. Yes. Um, is there, the question is, is there a specific case law that states that clinical trial protocol without results is not enabled, hence not novelty destroying dosage re re regime claim? I mean, that is uh, that case law exists, yes. It's it's basically a general principle for treatment for method of treatment claims that lack of lack of um, results um, would render that anticipation not novelty destroying. But um, I come to that later, and I can I can further share some other decisions with you guys. Okay. Now a second case is about sufficiency. That was a case about trastuzumab. Um, where the claimed dosage regimen was 8 milligrams per keg loading dose and 6 milligrams per keg tri-weekly. Um, the existing prior art regimen was 4 milligrams per keg loading dose and 2 milligrams per keg weekly dose. However, in the patent application for the, for the modified 8 milligrams and 6 milligrams per keg, um, no efficacy data had been shown. Um, and for that reason, already the Patent Office, uh, the, the, the Opposition Division on the, the Board of Appeal was of the opinion that there was no sufficiency uh, uh, data that could show that this modified dosage regimen was plausible to achieve the claimed effect. Um, what the patent proprietor did is that they filed late data um, that showed that trastuzumab has a longer half-life than initially thought, so that the modified dosage regimen was surprisingly equally efficacious, but the Board of Appeal did not accept that data. And that is, again, a principle at the European Patent Office you, that has been confirmed in G2 out of 21. That is, you can file late data when you want to support inventive step, but when you, when you want to support sufficiency, uh, late data are not, late file data are typically not admissible because sufficiency must exist at the priority date or at the filing date. Um, a third example is obvi and about obviousness. 
this was a case about um, again about rituximab, where the claim was focusing on the use of a dosage regimen for the um, of, of rituximab for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, which was resistant to TNF alpha inhibitors. Now. The prior art, the prior art document existed, which disclosed the same dosage regimen, also for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but not rheumatoid arthritis, which is resistant to TNF alpha inhibitors, but rheumatoid arthritis, which was refractory to the treatment with methotrexate. And the board of appeal found that that document D1 would have motivated the skilled artisan to use the claimed dosage regimen for also treating rheumatoid arthritis resisting to TNF, uh, resistant to TNF alpha inhibitors. So the, the transfer from refractory to metotrexate to resistant to TNF alpha inhibitors was considered to not be inventive and that there was sufficient expectation of success. Good. What I would like to place an emphasis on in this in this presentation is the impact of clinical trial disclosures on patentability of those adrenaline claims. Um, well, there are basically two different two different scenarios. One is the handing out of drugs to patients, and the other one is the publication of a clinical trial plan. And um, here I just want to emphasize, um, I, I want just to briefly address both scenarios. Um, in some cases, patients typically not in in, bio, in in biotech cases, because in biotech cases, drugs are typically administers, in, administers um, uh, SC or in um, uh, intravenously. But in small molecules, sometimes it happens that patients can go home, or test candidates can go home and can take the testing drug home. And according to the logic of the Board of Appeal, um, even the theoretical opportunity that something leaks into the public because there would be no confidentiality agreement, that is considered enough to make that activity novelty destroying. Even if that thing has never happened, only the theoretical possibility that it could have happened is enough. Um, there's decision T7 out of 07, where patients went home with a, with a, with a contraceptive and the Board of Appeal found um, that by handing out the drug to the patients, the sponsor has lost control over the drugs after these had been handed. And for that reason, the theoretical possibility existed that patients could share that those pills with other people. And for that reason, this, this alone was considered novelty destroying. Um, it's important the patients were not hospitalized. They could take the drugs home, but they, they did not sign a, a CDA. Um, and that is sometimes recommended in the third-party literature that you should have patients sign a CDA when they go home with the drug. I, I, I believe it's ethically problematic because when patients go home with the drug and when they have side effects, they need to be able to speak, for example, to a doctor with their drug. And that has been confirmed by a U.S. court decision, which finds um, 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 it inadmissible for test persons to, find, to sign a CDA. Doctors, of course, but test persons, um, have, letting test persons sign a CDA is unethical, at least in the U.S. I, and I would assume that a similar principle applies in Europe as well. Um, in a similar decision, T239 um, um, out of 16, per, patients were even encouraged to discuss their participation with their family and with a doctor. And for that purpose, they had been handed out an information leaflet with a complete dosage regimen. And that, again, was considered novelty destroying. There's another decision that's T670 out of 20, basically the same, the same scenario. However, um, the patients were not obliged to sign a CDA, but they got clear instructions to take the medication strictly according to instruction and to return unused medication. So no CDA, but strict use restrictions. And in that case, the Board of Appeal considered that under these circumstances, the use at home would not render the formulation public and that was as and on, on that basis not considered novelty destroying so there is a very thin line which separates novelty destroying take home from non-novelty destroying take home um, i would assume that this is a case for the large board of appeal but i mean at least here we have a thin line to separate these two cases from one another now 
The second scenario is clinical trial plans. Um, both in the European Union as well as in the in the US, sponsors have to publish their clinical trials. And at least in Europe, they have to, all documents which sponsors submit to the EMA have to be made public at the what what the rules say at the first opportunity. So probably as early as possible. And that of course can pose a problem if you disclose dosage indication or dosage details in your clinical trial plan. Um, and I just wanted to show you just some three the, the three different stages of clinical trial plans. We have phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is a dose ranging, typically a dose ranging trial with healthy volunteers. So the idea is not to investigate the efficacy of the drug, but simply to find out a safe a safe dosage. What is what is the highest dosage with still tolerable um, tolerable side effects? And for that reason, you take healthy volunteers. And because you take healthy volunteers, you cannot examine efficacy. Um, phase two um, already starts with an assessment of efficacy and side effects, but with relatively small um, patient numbers. And phase three then is a large scale trial um, in order to make this statistically sound, but with more or less the same the same approach as in phase two. And you have different levels of success rate. So in phase one, you have a typically a success rate of 52%. In phase two, you have a success rate of an average 29%. And in phase three, you have about, again 58%. Meaning that if you accumulate phase one, phase two, and phase three, you have a cumulated success rate of 8.7%. Now, in a in a, if you start with phase two, because you want to elaborate a new dosage for which you already know that it is safe, but you want to see whether that dosage is efficacious, then you would only have to accumulate the success rates of phase two and phase three, so you end up with a cumulated success rate of 17%. Um, this, is, this, this might be important when we speak about reasonable expectation of success. Um, I have investigated the case law of the Board of, Board of Appeal in, in very much detail, and I have the full details in the appendix, but I don't want to, for, for each case, I have a, a, a separate slide. I don't want to, I want to spare you this exercise and have just summarized the different, the different scenarios here. But if you want, you can then, of course, refer to the slide in the appendix. Well, well, we, we, we have, have a question. Yes. We have a question. Um, inventive step. Um, some EPO decisions require expectation of failure of a clinical trial in order to acknowledge inventive step. This is clearly an unreasonably high threshold. Do you see any trend toward the Board of Appeal moving toward a consistent assessment of inventive step in view of the prior trial disclosure without results? Yes, this is basically scenario number two in this table. You see that, where um, uh, where there is an expectation of failure. I, I go to that, but but just to just to answer your question, I think I think it's pretty much a case to case decision. I have problems to find a really a red line in the in the in the board of appeal decisions. We have four different types of scenarios, which which have are slightly different from one another, and I do not see a, a, a general trend. But let, let me discuss the four the four scenarios. Um, so, so in the first column you see the scenario that I'm discussing, and in the second, in the in the third and second and third column, you see the respective decisions. And I, because because there's not so much case law here, I have I have separated between second medical use claims, where clinical trial disclosures may also have an impact in terms of of of, of prior art, and also dosage. Now, for example, if the clinical trial plan for an active pharmaceutical ingredient provides the skilled person. Um, and uh, well, well that, that's that's basically the, the statement, not if. Um, in scenario number one, the boards of appeal came to the conclusion that the clinical trial plan for an API provides the skilled person with a reasonable expectation of success, that the treatment would be successful even if no therapeutic results are shown. And one argument here is that, well, the clinical trial plan has to go through an like scientific and ethical committee. And if the scientific committee not gives a nod in saying, well, there is a reasonable ratio between risk and expectation of success. For that reason, it is ethically uh, 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 or scientifically uh, um, um, justifiable. Um, this logic could then be also transferred into the patent world by saying, okay, if the scientific board says that trial is scientifically 
justifiable because there is expectation of success, then we can translate that also to the patent world, arguing that this would provide the skilled artisan with expectation of success. Um, a second scenario is where the boards came to the conclusion that the clinical trial plan creates expectation of success even if no therapeutic results are shown, unless the state of the art suggests an expectation of failure. So if there's like, a, if, if there's a clinical trial plan which discloses the dosage regimen, um, however, there's another prior art document that says, well, in this specific condition, uh, um, there's there, there's there's a caveat and there's a risk involved in anything. Um, and in such situation, there would, if there is a prior art out there which suggests an expectation of failure, that would reduce expectation of success to hope to success. And that would then uh, 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 that would then be a clear indication that the claimed dose regimen is inventive. There's a scenario number three, uh, where the board of appeal argued that the clinical trial plan does not automatically provide the skilled person with a reasonable expectation of success, unless there's positive reports out there of similar treatment regimens, which can create such reasonable expectation of success. So this is pretty much the opposite of 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 of, of situation number one, um, and in one of the two decisions I'm referring in the, the second column, the board even argued that the authorization authorization of a clinical trial by a respective scientific or ethical board does not represent the scientific advice on the development program of the investigational product tested. So that is pretty much the opposite of what is being said in, in, in scenario number one, where that scienti the, the, the nod by the scientific committee could automatically be translated into reasonable expectation of success in the patent world. These decisions say the opposite. It's not, it's not what, what scientists say in the in the committee to 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 to, uh, to 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 wave through the clinical trial plan, that is not what patent professionals would say with regard to reasonable expectation of success. And then there's a fourth group of decisions where the clinical trial would only be considered indicative of a therapeutic effect if therapeutic results are also provided. Um, and that, of course, is is um, uh, uh, that would would well rule out most clinical trial plans from being considered for inventive step. Um, there's two other groups of decisions which do not really fit into this hierarchy. However, I would like to share them with you. Um, there are decisions where the clinical trial plan investigates different embodiments of dosages without showing results, and then selecting one of these embodiments can be inventive. I mean, this 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 is this brings us into the into the field of selection inventions, but that is something. So, if you want to increase your chance that even if you disclose, even that you disclose the uh, clinical trial plan, uh, you still can get a dosage patent. Um, one idea would be to <laughs> to investigate different embodiments or to publish different embodiments in your clinical trial plan. And then you select one for your for your dosage patent. Another interesting point is that some decisions say that contrary to a clinical trial plan, a scientific article which suggests investigating a drug for treatment does not create expectation of success. So the boards of appeal make a difference between is the prior art publication a clinical trial plan or is it just a scientific publication which says, well, it would be an option to use drug A for the treatment of disease B or whatever. There, the case law, the boards make a make a strong difference. As said, I'm rushing through. I've been rushing through you through this table, but I have the full details in the appendix and um, um, for for your for your convenience. So, what we can say is it's we, difficult we to question. find. Yes, we please. have a question. Um, what is the EP practice regarding the grace period prior to patent filing? Mm, I'm not 100% sure whether I understand it because the EPO does not, European patent law does not, does not have a grace period. Right. So there is a difference, of course, in the US, but in Europe we do not have a grace period. So, so applicants could not could not refer to grace period in Europe. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to 
summarize here is that it's difficult to find concrete guidance in the case law of the Board of Appeal. Um, there seems to be a strong emphasis on case-related specifics. Um, as such, although we saw that there's different different tendencies and different scenarios, the, the fact that there is no red line is probably not a matter for the enlarged Board of Appeal to, 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 to refer to. However, what you can at least say is that the case law differentiates between the publication of a suggested clinical trial plan, and my impression is that phase one is considered less impactful than, for example, phase two or phase three, because phase one is typically being used with healthy volunteers, so therapeutic effect is not at all an issue. Um, and that scientific publications uh, which suggest the claimed use have a lower impact than um, um, clinical trial plans and are typically considered as to simply rely on mere speculation. That is that is the buzzword here. Um, just a short look into other jurisdictions. Um, there's a decision by the UK Supreme Court um, in, in, in with regard to Tadalafil, which is an erectile dysfunction uh, 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 drug. And court said, in running clinical trials, it is further found that the skilled person would have had a reasonable expectation of success in finding a safe and effic efficacious dose. So this pretty much says that the finding, the, the, the dose finding is pretty much within the routine of the skilled person. And um, that is echoed by another decision of the UK Court of Appeals, where the judge said the pharmacokinetics would not be a field that is slavish to calculations. And clinical variability means that such dosage, dosage regimens are always likely to fall within a range. Frankly, I like UK decisions because they are always so outspoken. But both decisions pretty much say that, well, dosage, dosage regimen or dosage finding is nothing that, that deserves a patent. Dosage finding is within the routine of the skilled person and it is not, it's nothing that deserves a patent. Um, then there is a Canadian decision, Teva versus PharmaScience, where the court said that the critical factor swaying the case in the patent's favor was the perceived complexity and the unlikelihood of success of clinical trials in view of the asserted prior art. So this is, in my view, a little bit more more differentiated than than the <laughs> than the brute force apply um, um, by the um, by the UK courts. So here the court really said, well, we really have to see the facts and, and and investigate about the complexity and really, really make get an idea about the likelihood of success of the clinical trial uh, in view of the asserted prior art. Um, then there's an interesting decision by the Federal Circuit in the US. Um, the patent claimed a dosage of 550 milligrams three times a day for 14 days. The phase two clinical trial did not anticipate the same dosage regimen because either they uh, um, um, either they went for 500 milligrams or they went for 100 1,100 milligrams, but not three times a day, only two times a day. And furthermore, the trial protocol did not disclose efficacy or safety data. However, a second reference existed, which disclosed 400 milligrams two three times a day but suggested that the optimal dose may be higher. And that is, I mean, that's interesting that you make a publication where you disclose a dosage regimen and discuss a dosage regimen, but then argue that the actual, the optimal dose may actually be higher. And the Federal Circuit said it would be hesitant to conclude that five tri two trial plans alone would provide an expectation of success. However, when you combine that clinical trial plan with prior art that points into the same direction, then there would be sufficient expectation of success as to the efficacy of the claimed dosage regimen. And for that reason, the patent was revoked. Um, so what, what to do with all this? And I, I try to split this up. What should patentees do? And what should opponents do or, or, or generics or biosimilars do? First of all, I mean, that is, that, is, that, is a, that is a mantra. Patentees should be careful with what they publish and, for, and in particular when they publish. Um, because for dosage patents, human in vivo data are necessary, patentees can try to either obtain those data in preclinical studies. For example, in small-scale off-label tests, 
which may be obtained, for example, under hardship regulations on individual subscription. And at least in at least in Europe, when you have to the requirement that you have to provide data that suggests the plausibility of the therapeutic regimen does not mean that these data must be scientific uh, statistically uh, safe. So the um, uh, uh, while clinical trials strive after statistical uh, uh, um, significance, data you need in the patent application do not necessarily be statistically significant. So small-scale studies might be sufficient in order to meet this plausibility requirement that enables that 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 um, 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 enables you to get your uh, to, to fulfill the the sufficiency requirement. And another option is that you redact the dosage data in the clinical trial publications. And I have a slide for that later on. Um, well, what should opponents do? They should, of course, take a deep dive into the regulatory dossiers. And it's always good to have so someone at hand who is able to read these dossiers, who understands the publication process, um, and to find out, um, um, to, to really, really find the hidden information in these dossiers. Um, opponents should also consider the decision I've also re already referred to, G2 out of 08, stating that the whole body of jurisprudence relating to the assessment of novelty and inventive step applies. So they should really play the inventive step card. Um, that means, in particular, um, they should consider arguments why, starting from the closest prior art, there was a reasonable expectation of success that the claimed dosage regimen would be functional. That is my, my advice to opponents. Um, just a few few slides because I already um, um, mentioned that there is the possibility to re redact dosage information from clinical trial plans. Um, in Europe, this is regulated under Article 81.4 of the Clinical Trials Regulation, which states that the database shall be publicly accessible um, unless confidentiality is justified on any of the following grounds. And there's a couple of grounds, and one is protecting commercially confidential information. And of course, the question is, what is that? And there's a, there's a secondary document by the EMA, which states that in some instances, those details may be considered to qualify as commercially confidential information. Uh, and in such case, sponsors can include dummy, dummy data, like zero, zero digits, in the related structured data fields of the database. Um, however, it would be required that the sponsor proves that the specific information constitutes patentable matter. And of course, the question is, how can you prove that? How can you prove that dosage information constitutes patentable matter? I mean, in principle, it's patent eligible because the dosage patent category is patent eligible, but um, there's no way to prove that is patentable. So uh, I, I find that a very weak formulation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't care too much about it. I would simply do it and wait what happens. In the US, we have the Freedom of Information Act, which, um, um, re which well, is, 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 is a basic rule. However, under Section 2021, 20, there's possibilities to exempt or to, to, to hide information from the Freedom of Information Act. And that is in particular trade secret, uh, which may consist of any commercial commercially valuable formula that can be said to be the end product of innovation or, or commercial or financial information, which means valuable data for information which is held in strict confidence or regarded as privileged. Um, and these types of information um, in a regulatory dossier are not available for disclosure. That is what uh, Section 21 says. Um, it does, this section does not mention explicitly dosage data, but just from my informal information, which I shared with US colleagues, um, I understand that dosage information would qualify as such information, as such trade secret, and for that reason can be, is not available for disclosure uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, one last case is the Riva Roxaban case. Um, that's about Bayer's anti-clogging agent Riva Roxaban. It was revoked in opposition. Um, so the, 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 the claimed dosage regimen, has, it has no dose level, but it simply says one day for five consecutive days. 
And there was a phase one trial document, D15, D17, which disclosed uh, 30 milligrams once daily. And on that basis, the opposition division found the claim to lack inventive step. The Board of Appeal overturned the decision and maintained the patent as granted, simply by stating that the phase one study um, was a study that in which no efficacy was shown because it was it was determined in healthy subject it was it was used in healthy subjects so no information with regard, regard to the clinical efficacy was shown and no information with regard to safety in real patients was shown and there's the special situation that this is an anticoagulant treatment where the therapeutic the therapeutic window is very narrow because i mean if you if you if you over if you overdose um, such drug in a healthy per person that may have a different effect than if you overdose that drug or give the same drug to a, to a, to a person that is suffering from, from a hypercoagulable state. And for that reason, the Board of Appeal was of the opinion that that phase one study could not be deemed um, uh, 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 relevant for inventive step. Um, um, we, we have questions. Yes, yes, please. Um, but uh, re regarding the rejection, for example, um, uh, one question is: I assume that all these reduction options, uh, reduction options, um, have to be done uh, at the outset. Thus, the persons in charge of the trials must be informed and trained, and this can't be invoked after the fact, right? I fully, I fully agree. I think, and to be honest, I sometimes wish in our law firm we had people, not patent lawyers, but general lawyers who are who are knowledgeable in regulatory law because i think there's a strong overlap between at least in this particular field there's a strong overlap between our activities and the activities of of, of regulatory law people um, and i think this applies as well um, uh, to pharma companies you need a crosstalk between patent uh, your your in-house patent people and your in-house people who do regulatory law and of course prepare them in a situation where the clinical trial proposal is submitted uh, what to submit what to not to submit what to redact and what not to redact and of course i fully agree that this has, has to be done before the um, before the trial proposal is being submitted uh, i fully agree with that there, there's one one additional remark um, regarding hiding the information um, the remark was, I was surprised to see that neuro neurocrine recently achieved in at the obligatory clinical trial publication to use the wording at a dose without specifying the dose. Did, did you see that? Or I, I didn't did see similar things. I, di I didn't see that, but it's it's it simply simply reflects what is what is um, 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 suggested by the EMA Q and A document, where they say just sponsors can include dummy data, for example, zero zero digits instead of the real the real dosage. I think that pretty much reflects that that situation. We we have one more question. Sorry, <laughs> yes, a lot no of problem, questions. No problem. Yeah. Um, patient population. What if someone has in vivo human data, but with a low population, like two or three patients? Do you see any downside? Well, as I said, my experience is that examiners do not look for statistic, statistical significance. And to be honest, the term or the, the, the concept of making a therapeutic effect plausible is a very low threshold. Plausible does not say it has to make a therapeutic effect statistically significant. So maybe maybe two or three patients is pretty much at the bottom level. But maybe the truth is somewhere in between. I would say you do not need like patient size of 300 or you do not or 2,000 or 20,000. I think if you are able to do a preclinical small scale study, which is not subject to the, to the regulations of clinical trials, um, and you have like a, you have like N equals five or 10, I would try to, to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Now let's go back to the River Oxaban case. It was revoked by the opposition division. It was then um, um, re-established by the Board of Appeal because it said the phase one trial would not provide sufficient expectation of success. However, under the specific circumstances that you have here an anticoagulant where the therapeutic window is very narrow um, and where data obtained with healthy volunteers cannot automatically be translated to patients suffering from hypercoagulation, 
Well, when you look into the landscape in Europe, because that case then went into national invalidity proceedings, it's just it's just um, it's just a mosaic of different decisions. It, it is about to be maintained in Germany. It has been revoked in the UK. It has been maintained in the Netherlands. It has been revoked in France. It has been maintained in in Sweden and in and in Belgium, and outside of Europe, it has been revoked or maintained. So. You see how little harmony we have. If we only focus on Europe, we, we see how many, how, how little harmony we have here, um, and that, of course, is a call, in my view, to the unified patent, to the unitary patent, because I mean, irrespective of whether you like dosage patents or whether you object them, I think there's there's common understanding that a certain amount of harmony would probably be desirable here. Um, just two pending cases, which which you might have an eye on. That is one case we have been involved in about a formulation of um, of about a combination of uh, the antibody daratumumab and hyaluronidase, uh, three hundred thousand um, um, with a with a given dosage regimen. Um, the prior art was the phase one trial plan, which did not anticipate the exact same dosage, but very narrow dosages. Um, and the opposition division came to the conclusion that um, that D11 document, that prior document, did not contain any results. However, there was no technical effect shown by the patent relative to that earlier, that pre-published dosage regimen. Um, the patent proprietor argued that there was a reduction of um, injection-related reactions, but the opposition division was of the opinion that that reduction was not related to the distinguishing feature, that is, the, the, the difference between 30,000 units and 40,000 units. So the effect, even, even though there was an effect, the board said, the opposition division said, there is no, that, that effect cannot, cannot be attributed to the uh, distinguishing feature. And for that reason, the opposition division revoked the patent. It's now in appeal. Interestingly, there's a divisional pending with almost the identical claims, only that instead of 30,000 units of hyaluronidase, the claim now says 30,000 to 45,000 units, and that is also under opposition. Another interesting case is about um, the anti-IL-12, IL-23, P40 antibody ustekinumab for the treatment of ulcerative colitis. The same dosage regimen exists, has been known in the prior art already for Crohn's disease, uh, which is closely related to 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 ulcerative colitis, both run under, under the under the uh, uh, expression inflammatory bowel diseases. So it's interesting how the um, uh, opposition division will see that when you when you translate a dosage regimen from one medical indication to another one, which is closely related, whether this would whether there would be reasonable expectation of success that this transfer would be would result in a therapeutic effect. Now some conclusions. It's difficult to find concrete guidance in the case law of the boards of appeal. There seems to be a strong emphasis on case-related specifics. At least, as I said, the EPO case law differentiates between publications of a suggested clinical trial. Phase one is considered less meaningful than phase two or three. And other, spe other publications, scientific papers, which suggest the claimed use, these would be typically disregarded as mere speculation. Um, However, in some cases, phase one planes have actually been considered relevant by the Board of Appeal. And that is surprising because the patients are healthy and the lack of toxicity was the goal of such study and not the efficacy. And in order to, um, uh, in order to be enabling prior art, you need to show efficacy and not, not merely the lack of toxicity. Um, something which did not surprise me is that the UK courts apply an extremely high bar on inventive step. Um, that that means that it's not atypical that patents that have survived EPO's opposition bonfire are revoked by UK courts, and that that will continue even when we have the unitary patent court, because um, the UK is no longer in. Um, and my impression is that US decisions seem to judge the cases more or less along the lines of the boards of appeal of the European Patent Office. 
Um, just one last thing, memorial quote. There's the Rena Renaissance physician Paracelsus. Some call him uh, an alchemist. However, in those days, it was probably difficult to see whether you are an alchemist or a real scientist. And he said, all things are poison, and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes a thing not poison. And I think this pretty much tells us, reads on the, on the, on the situation. A, do a dose can be efficacious or can be poisonous. And the question is, is dose finding an invention? One article, which is unfortunately quite old, but discusses some of the principles which I, which I would be happy to share with you. It's, you can download it um, from the internet, but I can also send you copies if you want. And that's basically it. Thank you very much.